think you started with a story, so I'll start with an anecdote. Mr. Nandan is not here. So I was this, at this event where Mr. Mohandas Pai was talking to the SEBI chairman, ex-chairman, Mr. Damodaran, and he told a story where uh, something like Satyam happened in somewhere in Europe, and uh, Mr. Murthy was in travels in somewhere in, in Europe, and he called up uh, Mohandas Pai and, Mohan, how much money do we have in the bank? So Mr. Mohandas Pai said some figure, and he said, can you take a bank statement and send it across to me? So he said, I can take out all the money, keep it in the firm, and I can ask you to count it also. So that's the culture thing that Mr. Mohandas was saying that. So what somebody like Mr. Moti saying, he's scared, he, do we actually report the money that we have in the bank, or is it something else? So I think that's what the whole concept of culture from the Infosys story that I can, I can relate here. Yeah, I think, uh, Vivek, you spoke about uh, one of the top things is about the independence of board. I want to, and we have a lot of CFOs here. So can you share some anecdotes on how important and when should a startup have a CFO? Uh, as because CFO has a fiduciary responsibility to the board and the shareholders, right? Oh, wow, and we have a lot of CFOs here, okay. Yeah, that's a, a tough question to answer for the simple reason that I can't imagine a business without a CFO. Yeah, we, we do have a lot yeah. of startups who get CFOs at leaders. Get stage. CFOs over time. Look, you know, um, so CFOs in... in for the most part end up, most CFOs actually end up serving on boards. And there's a reason for that. They're either always an invitee to the board or they actually, or they actually serve as a board as a sitting director. And the reason for that is that you want to minimize the distance between shareholder interests and what's happening inside the business. I would argue, you know, my clients in private equity the first thing that the first person they will change or insert to minimize that distance between shareholder interests and company actions is they'll change the CFO. And so, actually, if you're thinking about that, I think there's a the, the simple answer is you know as you should have a CFO as soon as you are contracting revenue <laughs> with any customers. You need someone who is playing that role, whether they're a professional CFO or someone playing the role with some degree of oversight. You want that to happen. And if you don't have a CFO early, have a subset of the board play a little bit of an audit um, committee function. So even if you don't have a CFO, you can't afford a CFO, you don't believe a dedicated role is valuable at that point in time, have a few members of the board who have some financial background and acumen help play that role, if you will, or help, bow, help ensure that the, uh, the processes you're following are still more or less within compliance. I think what the other, on the same independence, you said the board has to be quite independent. You should have independent directors in the board, right? At least one by third. And we see some of some of the charts that you mentioned that they only get it when they become IPO or they are towards the IPO story. Now, one argument counter to that is we see a lot of VCs are board members who are investors. Them, so the partners are, and, and no offense to any of the VCs here, but we see that, right? Now, one argument for them is that uh, if you get an independent director who doesn't understand the new age tech business, how do you actually okay. contribute to the growth? As a VC partner, I know more about the business. We have put in money, we have done due diligence. So what, what argument would you give for that? That's an easy one. Um, the value of independence is not to know more about the business than the founders. The value of independence is not to know more about the business or the investment thesis than the investors. The value of independence is to bring a critical independent eye to the functioning of the business. And importantly, the, even the, what I'd call, there are three parts of these boards, right? Boards have the board mandate. Is the mandate of the board appropriate for that point in time? Board interactions are the quality of interactions. Board. You introduce independence into a board, the quality of the interactions, the quality of the questions will change immediately. You have a whole bunch of folks with the exact same thinking around the board. It's, you know, you could argue at some level of diversity, right, of thinking. Um, and then there's an element of culture. Um, one thing that when everyone has a vested interest in ensuring that everything keeps going well, at some level, that vested interest, it becomes a vested interest. That you, it's very difficult to bell the cat. Independence can ask tougher questions. Say, look, this sounds good, but we really consider the consequences down the road. Um, and, and to some extent, hopefully independence, they don't have as much skin in the game. And so without as much skin in the game, 
the value of their advice is hopefully a lot more objective. So what I'd say is if you care about objectivity, get them on. I wouldn't worry too much about whether they understand your business up and down. Most board members you bring on have seen multiple businesses. They get it. They're quick studies. Um, so that's the quick way to answer that question. Do you see uh, certain other jurisdictions having more independent directors in their board early on in the startup space? Yeah, it's a good question. So we start to analyze that in North America and in, in the UK and a few other places. The quick answer is yes. Um, they seek out independence for credibility. They seek out independence for, for independence. And actually, a lot of the big VCs bring independence along with them. Um, and you'd be surprised in, in many cases, in some cases, VCs have actually put policies in place where they want independence to represent them, which is interesting. It's a bit like what Temasek does. For a long year, for many, many years, Temasek never put their own people on board. Now, they have, now they've changed that. But they had independence represent them. Now, how independent is that is a good question. They're clearly representing the shareholder. But they want to be represented by a voice and a pair of eyes that themselves aren't as vested in, in the business. So yeah, we, it is higher. I don't have an, a number for you because we're still looking at the numbers. Yeah, one last one to me and before we open it to the crowd is uh, the whole concept of financial reporting. You know, I, can, I can quote an example mm -hmm. of a very large unicorn uh, and related party transactions, right? So, so this unicorn was banking with us and uh, um, they made a two million dollar, a couple of million dollars payment to a logistics company. And when we asked for an invoice, they just prepared an invoice and gave it to us, you know. So we were actually, so we, we have, when we asked questions, the company said, okay, if you're not, you're not keen to have the account, we'll move on. Now, where do you draw the line on, you know, being tough with, with startups? And I'm, 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 in general, I'm talking about the ecosystem players over here. You know, there's a lot of ecosystem players here, like yourself, uh, who are supporting startups on financial reporting. Uh, two questions here. How do you fix a framework for financial reporting? You said having a CFO early is good, but is there anything else that you can do? And, and when do you ask the tough questions? And so on the financial reporting side, the really simple answer, not to oversimplify it, is to have independent audit. It doesn't matter how big or small you are. You can hire an accounting firm. You can hire an audit firm. And you, you can ask them to apply certain standards to everything you do. And when you do that, by the way, something like having an invoice that was generated on the day you actually produced, <laughs> bought those services. I can give you more stories, okay? Yeah. Uh, I'm when sure we you do, can. so as bankers, we do a lot of audit, which typically the due diligence is GST, uh, triangulating data with the bank statements and invoice, and, and you can get invoices predated and postdated, okay? Yeah, but the, your other question is a, well, your other question is a very um, important one. When, when a founder effectively blackmails you, you know, you want an invoice? Fine. Invoice or me? In my experience, and um, in my experience, the minute that raises its head, it's not a matter of when, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when you're getting rid of them. And there'll be many investors around here who know this is true. You know, at housing, when things were bad, people just went through it because you couldn't get around the cult of personality. And eventually it blew up. Um, this is not to say that young founders aren't impetuous. This is not to say that they aren't offended. This is not to say, but knowing the difference between an error of omission and error of commission matters. Young founders will often make errors of omission. And as an investor or as an adult on the board, you have to be able to discern between those two. When, when you can tell people are making errors of commission, and they knew better, and when they're confronted with it, the only right response is, I messed up. I'm sorry this won't happen again. If the response is, well, thank you for raising that. Do you want me around, or do you want to run the business? Do you know the business? Do I run the business? Are you the one interacting with suppliers or am I the one interacting with suppliers? I'll tell you at that point, the time is marked. And we can, you, know, you, can, you can tell me that lots of founders are out there who continue to espouse those types of, um, or, 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 or respond in that manner. I'll tell you, they will eventually mellow and find their, find their ground. But I guess time, more often than not, time is marked.
Yeah, I think some tough questions over there. Thanks, uh, Vivek. And I'll probably open it up to the audience if they have any questions for Vivek uh, over here. Uh, any questions? Yeah. Hi, thank you, Mr. Vivek. Uh, extremely, extremely insightful deck. I have not seen this kind of quality in the last few years. Thanks for that. Uh, just one question from my side. I'm curious to understand and know your views. Uh, I understand the importance of having the independence director on the board, but many early stage startups or the mid stage startups, even though they do have an appoint someone as independent directors, whether the term independence is really implemented in spirit is something always under the question mark. So because many a times these independent directors come on board for the sake of coming for the name, but they don't do their job as yeah. diligently as what they're expected to do. So your take on that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, picking an independent director is no different than picking a great hire. You need someone, you need someone who knows the task. You need someone who has some degree of experience. You need someone who's actually willing to do the work. So, you know, and, and this is, um, can you close that door? Yeah. Um, So this conversation, by the way, about independent directors used to happen a lot between me and um, family business owners. And family business owners for a long time had independent directors who were just friendly to the family. And the reality is they weren't related to the family, they weren't investors, and therefore they were considered independent. But the reality is that directors know why you're picking them. And so, if you're a founder and you're picking a director and you're saying, boss, I need an independent director, we've got a great equation, come on board, you know this is what's happening, I'll keep you updated, I need to keep the peace, eh, that's a different kind of relationship. If you come, into a, come to an independent director saying, look, we're preparing, we need to actually make sure governance doesn't go sideways, I've got a tough board with a lot of tough questions that need to be asked, I feel like we're not getting the challenge we need. That's a different conversation. So actually, at some level, your question's a very good one, right? How do you avoid dud independent directors? I think a lot of it comes down to what the director assumes you want and what you're hiring. If you're hiring for independence, it's pretty clear. If you're not, it's like all the family-owned businesses I used to work with. You know, you'll, get, you'll get what you seek. And by the way, you know, in India, there's a lot of people who are willing to lend their name for independence at a price. It's just not worth it. Not for the director or the business, actually, both ways. Yeah. Uh, hi, this is Ramni. Is there really a scientific valuation method? Because the kind of valuations that we are looking at, especially in the private equity space, uh, I mean, uh, really baffles us, especially those who are uh, in listed company space. So, uh, and that slide is very informative, especially where you have shown how the unicorns valuations have diluted and melted away over years. So, you know, the quick answer to the first part of your question, which is, is there a method of valuation? I would refer you to McKinsey's book on valuation. <laughs> Tim Kohler has done a great job. It's been the, you know, um, um, the go-to for a lot of people, not just in business school and later, but a lot of professionals. Look, the price of ideas has never been higher. And you could argue that's a that that's for a couple of reasons. I won't explain them all. The price of ideas has never been higher, in part because the amount of capital available in private markets has never been higher. The amount, the space and speed of technology disruption. I was talking to an investor the other day, a very well-known one, I won't name them, and they said they've gone from looking at Gen, Gen AI as a huge opportunity that could actually result in a lot of new funding to, we're done with the hype. This is simply going to be another tool available to most businesses and getting by, and anything with the word Gen AI on it is not going to get us to the table or attract a higher multiple. Now, this is a investor, by the way, that has seen many of these cycles over time. And I could tell at some level, the, the price of an idea or the value that you're willing to pay, for better or for worse, really sits with the investor and how willing they are to pay that price at some point in time. So, you know, I, I, the, the answer to your second question, the second part of your question is probably not. 
Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yep. Just last two questions. Yeah. Good evening. This is Sashant. Yeah. Good evening. This is Srinivas here. I have two questions for you, uh, Mr. Vivek. Uh, my first question is that uh, you often see uh, in startups or you know mature startups board members getting ESOPs. Um, have you seen that? And if so, uh -huh. that is a uh, you know uh, what's your take on that? And my second question is that when you do have marquee investors on boards uh, and the uh, founders, the CEOs take wrong decisions. Many a time, there is silence from the investors, uh, which leads to you know what we're seeing in the news. So, uh, just wanted to hear your views on those. So I got the first question. I'll ask you to quickly repeat the second one. The first one, go ahead. The second yeah. question. Was? Second one is uh, uh, on boards of uh, many startups. We see that when you have marquee investors, and there are wrong decisions taken by the CEO, tough mm. questions are not asked, and then they end up writing off that entire investment and it all comes in the oh, yeah. view. So what's your view on that? Okay. Um, so the first, first question you asked, um, should board members, this is a, 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 a point of debate, by the way. There's lots of papers out there about should board members be compensated with stock or not, right? Um, I think our view is very simple. You need to compensate board members. The question is whether the alignment of incentives is, is, it's not a question of whether they can have incentives or ESOPs. I think the issue that you actually talk to academics, talk to people who research this, it's the amount, it's the quantum. So at some point you go from being independent with some incentive to not independent because you start to look like an investor. And so the you know, investor is not an independent. So I think the quick answer to that question is it depends on the market. And there is a level of remuneration that's required for board members. Aligning it to the equity value of the business is not necessarily a bad thing, unless it gets to a point where it comes in the way of their being independent. If they start to act like any other investor around the table, that's an issue. And therefore, people have come around and said, no ESOPs, no stock. It's easier to go down that path. Uh, personally, I'm not sure that's the right answer, but that's a. Um, the second, what do I think about investors, marquee investors who've sat on companies that have gone to zero because of some mishap by the CEO? I think it's really embarrassing for those boards because here's a funny thing. It's one thing to have a company go to zero because it just didn't work out. And by the way, that will happen in venture. We know the record. It's not a bad record. You know, you'll get three to four zeros. You'll get a couple of, you know, get a couple of three to four MOICs. You'll get a couple of ten baggers. Maybe if you're lucky, a hundred to a thousand on the on the outer range. So actually, having a company go to zero unto itself is actually not that big a deal with the marquee investor on the board. The marquee, you know, marquee investor on the board, they have, to, they have to allocate their time carefully. So when a marquee investor gets onto the board, they're signaling to the, invest, to the fund and to the company, this really matters to us. So actually, it turns out that's not a bad thing. But I'll tell you what's bad is when you get to a stage and you're at the third round follow-on investment, you're now leading the investment round time after time, and then the place blows up. And if it blows up for reasons of governance, that's embarrassing for a board. Because actually, as it turns out, the board's role is not only to protect shareholders, it's also to ensure that there's a certain level of compliance and fiduciary responsibility that's being met by those running the business. And more often than not, I would say that when that happens, you would have to question the nature of the relationship between the chair of the board and the, C and the founder and CEO, and the nature of the relationship between the lead investor and everybody else on the board. But I don't have a clear answer for you because I, you know, we've seen many instances. Go, a company going to zero is not the end of the world. <laughs> it happens all the time. Um, it's, I think the context matters. Just, just one last question. Yeah. You have a question? Yeah. Sashank had a question. Thank you so much, Vivek. Um, I have a perhaps slightly controversial question to end your session with. Um, as, a, as a founder, I completely agree that um, governance is the founder's responsibility first and foremost. But as a lender, uh, we, we often mm. grapple with a problem of adverse selection, right? Where 
Despite best intentions, the process of deploying capital starts to attract higher risk individuals. And several of the examples that you shared were, I would go so far as to say, were known or suspected governance issues and yet continue to raise capital until things got to a point of being unbearable. And so I think my question to you, not to put you on the spot, is to what extent founders bear huge responsibility, but to what extent has the capital raising process and perhaps the, the, the excitement and enthusiasm of the last few years contributed um, to an adverse select problem in who raises funds? It's a really good question, and I, I feel like I have a point of view on it, so I'll, I'll just state it. Adverse selection in your book of who you lend to, again, like venture, there'll be some zeros, there'll be some bad eggs, you know. Having a, um, having a model that actually understands underwriting and sifting through the good and the bad is, is, is what your business is about. But when there's been lapses in governance and investors haven't acted on them, or as recently, as, as not, not, too, not too long ago, invest behind the same entrepreneurs <laughs> who had significant lapses, the, you know, they're sort of, the, the, I'll give, answer that question two different ways. One is a philosophical point, right, which is, you know, as a society of investors, are we going to simply make it known that this is now untouchable, please don't do this again, because this is untouchable. This is, by the way, in the philosophy of law and incarceration, it's actually meant to be a deterrent. So the reason Singapore will have incredibly high penalties for certain infractions that other companies won't consider a misdemeanor it's to set an example. And so the first answer to your question is, my view is that the society of investors, which is effectively a society, it's a group of people who set the rules, are they in broadly in agreement, right, like you know, regulators are at times, that certain infractions can never be revisited, and therefore the penalty we're putting on them is very high. That's one. The second is the more practical issue, and I, I've seen this in private equity, I've seen it in venture, I've seen it in private markets. There's always, there are a group of investors who over time learn the value of governance and they will not back certain types of companies. There's a, and, and they learn over time that through having been burned in the past that we're not doing that again. There's always, there are always the 10% of new funds being raised 10% of investors that are new, they're always someone new at the party who frankly needs to make their mark, needs to do a deal, and sometimes the need to simply put money to work transcends experience and judgment, which they often don't have at that point in time. And so then the whole industry gets up and says, I can't believe you went and, you know, you went and uh, uh, backed these, you know, this, uh, these individuals who had these obvious issues and the reality is there is always someone who is willing to do it. I think the question really, I'd go back to the first, as a, you know, as a society of founders, as a society of investors, as a society of board members, are you willing to call it out and say, that's bad? And by the way, when an investor does that, I hope a lot of the other follow-on investors who would be follow-ons say, look, I'm not, I'm not, because they say that behind closed doors. Like, I'm never touching this. Um, but yeah, I mean, so it's, it's, a, it's a good question because it's not an easy answer. But um, it is something that I think if you think about it, it is something that should be part of our culture in India and part of the culture of investors to turn around and say, you know what, certain things are just off the table. Thanks, Vivek. I think um, I think right timing for the for this discussion because we, we, would, we are expecting a lot of IPOs in the coming quarters, and some of them are tech IPOs. We've just seen a week of two weeks of almost 12 IPOs coming from India, uh, and hopefully we'll see a lot more tech companies. And I hope bankers ask tough questions. 
investors ask tough questions otherwise the slide that you showed where after listing the valuation came down wouldn't happen if the tough questions were asked on pricing i guess so on that note i think thanks a lot vivek and thanks capita india partners for this event so we'll i think we come to end of the session thanks vikant thank you